Hello, happy new year. First video of the year. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about something that's been on my mind um, for a little while. Um, and that's resistance training weights. Um, I talk a lot about specificity, um, technique, all that stuff. Um, I'm more than happy to keep talking about it. That's by no means a finished closed topic. Um, but I think given that quite a lot of my athletes have been watching other people on social media um, and by all accounts doing some pretty impressive things with weights um, in the context of my training group being so young they're starting to say things like Alex you know we need to do weights uh, we need to get stronger we need to get faster uh, and all this kind of stuff um, or rather they actually prefer doing weights um, I think that's possibly uh, for many reasons. One, I think because it's um, more mainstream than athletics. I think lifting weights is transferable for lots of different sports. Uh, I think people understand the concept of going to a gym. Um, it's quite trendy and popular to be a, a, a gym, gym rat, a gym fit person. Um, it's generally seen with a positive um you know, lens of if you go to the gym, you must be fit. Therefore, you look good. You're probably healthy, all that kind of stuff. Or you're strong. And you have all these desirable characteristics that young people probably want to have. Um, I am just putting a question, uh, Mark, on is it actually relevant to, uh, well, first of all, combined events, Um because that's my main area of where I'm looking to gain adaptations for. Uh, and two, um, athletics in general. Um, uh, I'm going to hark back to Antoli Bondachuk's exercise classification hierarchy. Um, yeah. You've got to make some kind of stretching argument to say that a lot of these exercises are specific to stuff in athletics um i think they firmly are under um sde specific development at best uh, specific preparatory at worst um it's not really uh the sde competitive exercise end or or top part of the pyramid um and I think with combined events, especially, you don't have a lot of time to be doing stuff that's not relevant. Um, and I think the temptation is is to think, well, if you're a professional athlete, you can have a lot more time because that's what you're doing professionally. So therefore, you've got more time to do this kind of stuff. And there are also other advantages as well. It doesn't always have to be about transfer. It could be the development of uh, connective tissues, all that kind of stuff, uh, all the stuff that's supporting um athletics behind the scenes not necessarily related to um performance it could just be you're doing it for fun um there's there's lots of different things hopefully and we'll, we'll tackle um some of them today um because it's def reading this article that was uh released in 2008 it's definitely um i don't know it's changed my mind but also it's kind of told me things i already knew um it's made me think about it a little bit more carefully uh, I think previously I'd had a um, when would be the right time to do weights uh, and that was kind of a two-way table of age versus training age type thing um, and that still is true um, but I think what has changed for me is I'd probably relic after what I'm about to show you I would relegate weights to an even lower proportion of training um, and in some cases I would eliminate it entirely um, and I'll talk about that uh, as we crack on. So um, this group, uh, this group from the University of Copenhagen, uh, various universities across Denmark, uh, there were 16 men, all with little to no experience of any kind of resistance training or plyometric training, uh, all around 25 years old, give or take three, four years, height around 181 centimeters. So 5'11", 5'10", maybe six foot, somewhere around there. And they weight around 80 kilos, give or take 15 kilos. 
uh, and those are all the mean and standard deviations. And they split those groups up into two. There was the conventional resistance training, which we'll call CRIT group or CRT. And then there was the plyometric training, PT or PUT group, whatever. Um, and before this really got going, um, one of the members of the PT group had to pull out um, through an exercise unrelated illness. Um, essentially means they got an illness that had nothing to do with this exercise or any of the exercises they just had to pull out. No idea what that could have been. It could have been, you know, it literally could have been anything, um, but they had to pull out. Uh, so really it was eight people doing weight training or conventional resistance training versus seven doing plyometric training. Um, and so they did testing before, testing afterwards, um, and it was a 12-week program quite a lot of the testing they did um was a mixture well it was there was three strength based tests there was the one rep max leg press the three rep max knee extension and one rep max hamstring curl and then there was a counter movement jump um and a ballistic leg press exercise um so i'd probably argue actually all the tests were leaning more towards a conventional resistance training program they were training more specifically if anything so i'd probably say they had a bit of an advantage um the test also did by muscle biopsies uh the muscle cross-sectional area and the muscle fiber cross-sectional area and muscle fiber composition of the quadriceps hamstrings hip adductors um and that kind of stuff it also went into muscle heavy uh, myosin heavy chain stuff um which you're more than welcome to read. I'll I'll leave the the full link um, to the article in the, the description, or you can just Google it yourself. I left the the title of it on the front page. Um, it's an interesting read. Um, I just want to go through the main headlining type stuff, and I'll I'll go through some of the caveats as well. Um, so the conventional resistance training stuff, the crit group, they did three exercises. That's the incline leg press, the knee extension, and the hamstring curls. Um, all of them were tested before and afterwards. Um, and so I can't remember what the percentage rep max of it was, so whatever they did in the before testing, uh, 60, 70%, I can't remember what it was. You can read it for yourself. And they did all those sets and reps. So over 12 weeks, three training sessions a week. So that's 36 sessions. Um, every single one of them completed it without any injuries. Um, on first glance, it's quite a high volume session, even though there's a three exercises, um, three sets, 12 reps to begin with. And that kind of does a balancing tip like that so that there's more sets, but less reps. So we go from three sets of 12 to more like five sets of eights and sixes, that kind of thing. Um, and the in detail training protocol is, is, in the study but i think they were trying really to go for hypertrophy here uh, and they've said as much and the two minutes recovery between each set uh, contrast that with uh, the plyometric stuff so the seven people that did it uh, we're looking at hurdle jump overs double footed hop overs a boing 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 that kind of thing uh, counter movement jumps where you're just standing still you bend down and jump up as high as you can and then a very similar thing drop jumps so you're standing on a, a low bench uh, box that kind of thing you drop off and then jump as high as you can um, all the sets and impacts are there um, there was 15 seconds recovery between the counter movement jumps and drop jumps whereas the hurdle jumps were just continuous so you just go one two three so you jump over three hurdles and that'd be one set um the height progression for the hurdle jumps and drop jumps were individual so it was it was tailored to the individual it wasn't everyone just do certain stuff um yeah the repetitions corresponded to the repetition max loading that kind of thing um for counter movement jumps and other stuff that doesn't really apply that table bit was because this was split in two this table um and again uh this article actually said that everybody even the plyometric people finished this 12 weeks with no injuries you can argue the sample size is a bit small and so with a larger sample you might have some people dropping out and you might be able to compare the rates of completion and all that stuff but it is what it is um 16 people started or rather 16 people were recruited, 15 people started and 15 people finished, which is, you know, it's fair enough. Um, and so 
uh, the immediate question I thought when reading this is, were the workouts even similar enough for a fair comparison? I mean, you are literally comparing apples with oranges here. It's a different type, type of training. How can you compare these different things? And the way they argued it was, was basically time and work done, energy expenditure. So they, they measured uh, based on the training um, exercises and all this other measurement stuff that they did was they worked out that the amount of joules or calories burned doing this was about the same. Uh, it was about 8,000 calories or eight kilocals per session. Uh, and the time was just under an hour for both sets, uh, both sessions, sorry. So it took about the same time. It was doing the same work in the same time, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, where it differed, though, uh, and they noticed this, was the time under tension for the muscles. So for the conventional uh, resistance training, when they videoed it, they, they noticed, well, they, didn't, they noticed that... Um, the muscles are contracting for about 200 seconds per training session, uh, just over three minutes. Whereas the time under tension for the plyometrics is about 20 seconds, thinking about all those muscle impacts um, and so on. Yeah. And so clearly, um, if you're using the same amount of energy, doing the same amount of work in a shorter amount of time, then clearly one is of a higher intensity than the other, 10 times more intense, 10 times more powerful, that kind of stuff. Does that necessarily translate to 10 times better results? I guess we'll find out. Um, does it scale linearly is the term. Um, and they did mention that although there's various different ways of actually measuring um, these different exercises, they felt that these two ways of measuring was the fairest um, because if you're going to start talking about ground reaction forces, ground contact time, that kind of stuff, you couldn't compare equally between the two. Uh, for example, ground contact time and impulse, that kind of thing would clearly be harder to measure for resistance training because, well, you know, they're constantly in contact with the apparatus. So the contact time is however long the sets are. It's just not quite the same thing. Um, you could argue it's the amount of time it takes to push a complete rep and all that stuff, but it gets a little bit gray in that respect. And I think they just try to dumb it down and just keep it simple. So work done, done in joules, um, the energy spent, time under tension, uh, were the, the two comparative and contrasting things they, they noticed in terms of whether it was a fair comparison. Um, and the results. So uh, some caveats. So in terms of the actual strength and power testing, all 15 applicants did it. Um, but the problem with the muscle biopsy, um, the histochemical analysis kind of made the muscle fibers, uh, I believe the word they said was a structural integrity uh, wasn't good enough for testing purposes. I think what that means is they probably took uh, quite weak samples, maybe. Maybe it's part of the... The inherent process of doing it maybe it was some kind of um atpas chemical problem which ate away at the fibers i don't know or the atp as an enzyme it's uh here nor there but the point is after that uh the cross-sectional area muscle fiber composition stuff was reduced from eight to four and from seven to five uh in the conventional resistance training and the the plyometric stuff um respectively uh, so if you already had concerns about small uh, subject uh, or small sample sizes and subject variability, then yeah, that's probably just gone through the roof and that's made it even worse. Um, but yeah, considering um, the statistics, which we'll talk about in a second, I think that more than makes up for that. Um, but yeah, so that's just a little caveat when it comes to interpreting these as answers. And so if we start with the maximal muscle strength stuff, uh, apart from the one rep hamstring curl, there was no significant difference uh, in improvement between the one rep max leg press and the three rep max knee extension. Um, for a start, both the conventional resistance training and the plyometric stuff both proved results. So it wasn't like one set of training actually made you worse and the other made you better or they both made you worse. They both improved your maximal strength output um, and there was no significant difference between either two. Um, the only difference, uh, statistical difference anyway, we'll talk about that soon, was between the hamstring curls um, of the CRT group and the PT group. Uh, 
And the reason for that, they speculated, is because, well, there were no hamstring-specific exercises in the plyometric group, and so therefore hamstring stuff was more of a byproduct rather than active focus. Um, and so that was that was why. Um, so what they found really interesting, uh, they this group were actually expecting from previous literature, uh, sources 1335 from the previous study, they're actually expecting... Uh, not as much gain in terms of muscle strength um, from the plyometric group. Uh, and the reason why they feel they may have gotten more is because, well, the two reasons were compared to the previous studies. Um, the previous studies actually used shorter training periods. So instead of 12 weeks, I think it was actually eight weeks, six to eight weeks. And the higher initial training status of the subjects in those studies uh, were different. They're actually looking at um, professional athletes as opposed to um, raw amateurs is what we're dealing here. Uh, and I think the reason why um, they used raw athletes in this study, and I think it says as much in the study, is that um, they were looking to maximize, um, you know, it'd be more apparent if there were any percentage growths um, with you know, elite athletes, if there were growth, it would be so minimal, it, you know, it would, it'd be very difficult to trace or prove whether it's significant or not, um, which is its own field of study. Um, it's worth an experiment for sure. So the, the, the nuts and bolts of it is statistically uh, in the exercises that both protocols are doing, i.e. Um, a leg press and a knee extension. So hamstrings, uh, hip adductors, uh, calves, that kind of thing. There was no difference uh, in strength gain between um, conventional training um, and plyometric training uh, of the same uh, energy expenditure, um, which is important, especially if you're a female athlete and available energy is a thing for you. You've only got a finite amount of energy and you need to use your time effectively and not be too tired. Then, then it seems plyometric stuff is just as much bang for your buck. Uh, as weight training uh, if anything it's less time under tension um, which may or may not be correlated to muscle fatigue soreness that kind of thing so it's just worth thinking about and then when we move on to the power stuff so the maximal cmj it's the counter movement jump and the ballistic leg press which is the same as a leg press but you're just pushing as hard as you can and the plate kind of slides up so you break contact with your feet uh, it was found by no mean amount that the plyometric stuff was far greater in generating power um and so the you know approximately 10 percent increase in maximal counter movement jump height versus not a lot of change um, with the conventional stuff so the plyometrics clearly won there and what was interesting is the ballistic leg press was actually put in there um it was actually put in there, the ballistic leg press, to kind of, they even said as much, to uh, give a bit of a bias, uh, a power exercise that replicated some of the movement um, of the conventional um, resistance training um, because they worried that the transfer wouldn't be, you know. So to me, four out of the five tests, even though three were strength and two were power, four out of five directly correlated to the conventional resistance training, whereas only really the counter movement jump affected what well, was relevant to the plyometric stuff. So I kind of feel like the testing was was definitely biased towards the CRT to begin with, but it, it looks to me that the plyometric stuff, not only was it just as effective uh, for force development, but it was clearly way more uh, effective at um, power you know force force per time that kind of stuff uh if you wanted to be more powerful plyometrics were the way to go if you wanted to generate more force according to this study it's about the same um interesting uh and if we move on um so what did they say the lack of improvement in the counter movement jump performance with the resistance lot observed in the present study is contradictive to some findings but supported by others so they mm, not sure because there's there's evidence there was evidence to suggest that you know 
it should increase the counter movement jump and there's evidence to suggest it wouldn't um and it's most likely there is less transfer of training induced learning from the counter uh from the conventional resistance training exercises and the pt exercises to the cmg test uh, cmj test so th their argument was there was less transfer for what the resistance training lot were doing to the maximal height stuff uh yes there was less transfer that, but there would be some transfer i mean like with with jumping you'd use your buttocks your quadriceps and your calves they, they, i mean they would be the main uh, muscle groups that be active and from from what i can see you were definitely working those muscle group anyway but you're definitely working those muscle groups in the CRT. But anyway, but other explanations comprise subject variability. Yep, I get that. So subject variability means that everyone is different and, you know, they're not all just homogenous cookie cutter people. They've all got different ways of adapting to training. They're all individual. It's that kind of thing. Um, so subject variability was one of them uh, and the limited number of subjects and the small relative alterations in CMG performance. Um, although the, um, the plyometric group increased by 10%, which sounds massive, it only works out to a couple of centimeters. And so it's very difficult to say whether it's purely based on that test that test day, uh, but it was based on the, the training or maybe they got lucky um maybe it was a coordination thing so yeah there's lots of mitigating factors to think about um not just herald this is blanketly better than this um but it may be concluded that between the two groups performance improvement respectively is great in the tests that resemble most clearly the movement patterns for protocol specific exercises i.e the ones that did well are the ones that they got the practice in. So specific training meant specific results in the specific exercises. It's as simple as that. And it, it harks back on to Antoni Bondachuk's um, exercise classification hierarchy. Um, and so there is no surprise here. You know, the improvements happened because specific work was done for a specific purpose, you know. Uh, in the valuation of power, we also conducted a ballistic leg press because this test may be regarded as a compromise between, yeah, so essentially this was the part of the study that said, yeah, well, we're going to put the ballistic leg press in there as a kind of compromise to give the conventional uh, resistance training lot a fair chance. Um, I found this hilarious because the, as far as I'm concerned, the plyometric lot clearly outperformed the CRT stuff. And the CRT group were given advantage by giving one of the testing exercises that are more beneficial to them. So that clearly indicates to me that the plyometric stuff was way more effective um, at generating power uh, over a 12 week period and all the rest of the things um, being as they are. But, but yeah, I just found that interesting. So yeah, they specifically put the ballistic leg press in there to, to help with the CRT lot, essentially. So uh, there's various other things. Um, so in terms of cross-sectional area of individual muscles, not the muscle fibers, just the cross-sectional area of the muscles, um, they found that, yeah, uh, there was significant growth in the quadriceps, hamstrings, and hip adductors for both, um, about the same, uh, no significantly different stuff. But they found that the muscle fiber type or rather the by type sorry the muscle fiber cross-sectional area not the whole muscle but the the cross-sectional area of individual muscle fibers were actually a lot thicker in the um, conventional resistance training and were only a tiny bit thicker maybe not i think they said not statistically any different in the um, plyometric stuff so what that's talking to me is that the cross-sectional area is larger um, so the, the muscles are bigger, thicker, the whole muscle is thicker in both groups, but the muscle fibers themselves are thicker, uh, in just the conventional resistance training. So my question would be, well, what attributes to that in the plyometric one? Is there just more empty space? Um, and so in a kind of roundabout way, they do come on to talk about that. And we'll talk about it in a second. Um, so we applied plyometrics 
uh, to subjects with no prior strength training or involvement in sports activities involving SSC, which is the stretch shortening cycle. It's the kind of, um, we'll talk about it in a second, but it's essential to plyometrics. Uh, notably, no dropouts attributable to injury or injury symptoms were experienced in the plyometrics group. Uh, they didn't say that for the CRT group, just PT. So maybe they're expecting the plyometric group to get injured. Uh, interesting. Uh, whereas significant gains in maximal strength and power were achieved. Thus, the PT group training seems to constitute applicable strength training alternative in subjects unfamiliar with this training regime, at least when careful supervision and progress progression are provided. Uh, so in raw amateurs, it seems that plyometrics is a pretty good way of developing raw strength um, as well as power, uh, particularly in the developing days. Um, we can talk about like moving forward, like past that uh, senior level, but definitely uh, earlier on, I think this is a good argument, especially when you're coaching young children to say, well, actually, um, not only are you too young for this and your connective tissues haven't developed and you're still growing and all these other things, UKA development model, blah, blah, blah. There's actually evidence to suggest that at the beginner level, novice level, when you're significantly undertrained compared to a professional athlete, the, the strength gain in plyometrics is just as good. Um, and when you consider the power production, it's actually even better uh, if you do plyometrics than weight training. So to me, this is like a, not a silver bullet, but this is definitely a strong bit of evidence to say to young athletes, plyometrics are the way to go at your stage of development rather than weight, uh, personally. Um, the gain in muscle fiber cross-sectional area uh, evaluated by the histo histochemical procedures uh, seems to vary considerably between studies depending on the types of subjects recruited. So this is just talking about various other different subjects. So it's not consistent. Uh, depending on what's happened, depending on who's been recruited, depending on the protocols and stuff. And they've listed a bunch there. Um, there's different data for this. I mean, they even say themselves that I think when it comes to the muscle fiber cross-sectional area stuff and the histochemical procedures, there's a wild degree of variance here. Um, and so there's a bunch of statistics there where essentially it's a saying, um, Overall, though, the type 1, the type 2A muscle fiber cross-sectional areas, um, CRT is the way to go. If you want to make them denser, then for sure. Whereas plyometrics, there's no significant increase in type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers. Um, and yeah, this is essentially... Um, yeah, they, they talked about how in another study um, that there were up to 20 to 30 percent gains in type one and type two um, cross-sectional area for muscle fibers in a plyometrics group in one study but they'd clearly worked a lot harder they were saying this malisu et al study 30 to 40 percent more jumping reps with 30 to 35 percent short average training session duration and less recovery and all this stuff and if you tweak it you get a better result that kind of thing and i think that's probably worth um its own experiment but for for the most part yeah um it's not to say plyometrics can't do that but at least it seems like there there could be uh an element where you increase the intensity and you'll get a better result um it doesn't say in that study and i'll have to read it whether people dropped out due to injury and i think that's probably the big concern uh, especially with plyometrics is a very intense exercise whether you actually want to uh, run the risk of injuring an athlete. Um, and so notably, um, after PT, after the plyometric stuff, the increase in muscle cross-sectional area was not accompanied, accompanied by an increase in the individual muscle fibers uh, in the vastus lateralis, I believe, in the quadricep. Um, and so they're saying it possibly could be caused uh, by the biopsies not fully reflecting the overall change uh, in the length of the muscle, uh, just looking at cross-sectional area. Um, so the fiber length and the number of sarcomeres, which we'll talk about in a second, could have been in series versus in parallel, which we'll talk about in a second. And that could have increased after plyometric training concurrently with an absence of single muscle fiber hypertrophy. Um, so there's a diagram on the right. 
So if you look at the middle, where you just have like this boat with uh, three muscles, uh, bits in the middle, uh, the myosins, and there's the those that little thing like that. That's a sarcomere, um, and so there's three there. You can either have and it's surrounded by the muscle fiber in this crude example. And if you look to the top left, an example of hypertrophy would be within that single muscle fiber, there's now more sarcomeres and they're in parallel. So like two columns, if you like. Uh, hyperplasia would be where you have more muscle fibers, still single column, if you like, sarcomeres, um, versus a lengthening. So you've, you've increased the muscle mass, but you've kept the muscle fibers the same thickness, but they're longer. And so you've got more sarcomeres, what's called in series, um, as opposed to in parallel. And this article is essentially saying we believe that the CRT lot have gone through hypertrophy in the top left, um, where it's now in uh, parallel. And the, the plyometric group has had a muscle mass change, but the individual fibers haven't gotten thicker. So it's either... And they, it needs more essentially testing. It says in future studies should be conducted to examine the potential influence of PT, but essentially saying it can't make up its mind um, which one it is, whether it's hyperplasia or a lengthening of the muscle fibers. Um, to, they can't make up their mind to be sure, but they are saying that um, that if there were Sarcom more sarcomeres in series, it would explain a greater power output. And so it's a bit weird because if you look at muscles as types of strings, springs, sorry, kind of like accordions coming in and out, then is it necessarily intuitive that the, the one in parallel where there's two columns of springs, if you like, being like an accordion, that would be less powerful than a single accordion with more, with more, um, kink bits in it it's not immediately obvious um why one is better at producing force and one's better at producing power um and so why is it do, i mean which one do you want as as combined event athletes and for me as long as you're strong enough you've got enough force to deal with your body because the for me your body is the heaviest implement you're ever going to deal with everything else is lighter. You're pushing away shot puts, discus javelins, everything is lighter. Whereas that's not true for weightlifting. Your body weight is probably the lightest thing in weightlifting. Like you're going to be lift, you know, if you're back squatting 200, 300 kilograms or whatever, that's clearly heavier than you are. Um, whereas for athletics, the heaviest implement you're going to have to deal with is yourself. Everything is significantly lighter. And so the question would be, you know, do you want these larger cross-sectional area muscles that are more turgid but produce more force or do you want the longer muscles that aren't quite as forceful but um have a quicker contraction um and when i mean quicker they contract at the same time well we'll talk about it in a second um it's probably best with an animation so here you go you've got um, a muscle fiber at the top which is all the red ones so you've got three sarcomeres there and you've got the same amount of sarcomeres but at the bottom in blue but they're all in series as opposed to two in parallel and so what kind of muscle contractions do you think each of them are going to be so above that's the original length of the muscle fiber before contraction and now if i move all these objects so they contract at the same within the same time. So 0 0.7 seconds, this is what it looks like. Do you see that? And so which one do you think is better for athletics, for throwing things, for jumping, for sprinting? And so the question becomes, if they both did that contraction in the same time, because speed is distance divided by time, you have essentially, with the longer one, the one in series, you have pulled a greater distance in the same time. So that means because it scales up, 
you've essentially done double the distance in the same time. So that contraction has pulled something twice as fast as the shorter one in parallel. So that's all well and good, but the force production, there's no such thing as a free lunch. The force production of the red one is far greater and it scales up, it's twice as forceful. So if the blue ones could only pull a force of let's say 10 Newtons, then the, the, the two sarcomeres at top could pull a force of 20 Newtons and so on. So it's a bit scaly. When I say scaly, it's scale. So would you rather have less force, but pull it at a greater speed? Or would you rather have a more powerful contraction, but pull at a slower speed? And for me, I think the one at the top is really suitable for weightlifters, um, that kind of stuff. Whereas the blue at the bottom is the opposite end of the spectrum. And that's more for sprinters, definitely jumpers. And you'd probably argue there's a mix and match between the two, but probably leaning more towards the blue one um, when you're looking at throws and probably way, way, way more towards the, the bottom one when you're looking at really high velocity uh, events like javelin, where the arm speed just has to be ridiculous. Uh, arm speed, javelin, discus, hammer. I'd argue shot put as well. Um, but yeah, uh, to me, the, the, the blue one at the bottom um, is where you want to go. Um, and that's that was the results or the implied results, uh, possibly, from training plyometrically. Um, is, well, more studies need to, be, need to be made, but it seems like the, the top, the hypertrophy through sarcomeres in parallel, is resulting from conventional resistance training. And one possible explanation of why the plyometrics are so good is because you're getting your sarcomeres all in a nice long row in series. And so they're managing to really concertina uh, fairly quickly uh, and cover a bigger distance in the same amount of time. And so more thoughts and potential discussions. Um, how far can we say that this study is actually even useful or applicable for combined events? I mean, I've kind of hinted about it before. Um, for, for me, the short answer is a fair amount. Like, you can't, for, for me, I can't just dismiss this. At the same time, I'm not going to treat it as my gospel and say, like, this is the absolute truth. It's something that's kind of in the back of my mind. I'm thinking, right, okay, you know, I'm still not convinced about weights. I'm more than happy to keep reading articles and, and seeing, you know, what potential benefits are out there. But to me, this is, this has definitely galvanized um, my perception on, on plyometrics. Um, and this is, a, this is a massive turnaround from when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, where to me, it was just weights, 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 weights. And I just get in the weights room and crack stuff out. And, I wasn't a particularly good athlete and I was probably a bit muscle bound and there's various other reasons. Um, and this is, this is possibly one of the reasons. Um, when you look at sample size being too small and subject variability, um, I agree that comes into play. Um, but you have to look at something called the significance values. Um, and we'll talk about that actually now um, with a little bit of an example, but Essentially, all of these decisions uh, were done using something called hypothesis testing. And to try and dumb down hypothesis testing so that we can all understand it is essentially saying um, we've got a set of data. We don't know what the distribution of the data is. Probabilistically, we don't know. All we know is the data looks like this. And given that we were expecting this, how likely is it that what we've got isn't a possible outcome of what we were expecting? So an example of that would be, I've got a dice and you've told me that this dice is perfectly fair. So it's got six sides on it, one to six, um, and you're telling me it's perfectly fair. But in my mind, Maybe I've seen you roll the dice a couple of times and I've seen you roll like three out of five of those times that you got a six. And so I'm like, whoa, okay, that's a bit weird. How do I know that you've not just been lucky versus that dice is rigged? And so a hypothesis test would be, well, I'm going to 
in that example, it would be, well, I do my own probability uh, experiment and I'm going to roll the dice 10 times um, and I'm going to see what I get. Uh, my hypothesis will be, and the null hypothesis would be that everything's fine. It's what the standard assumption would be. And in that case, it would be that it's a fair dice. Someone's told me it's fair. I've got no reason other than my own, like, you know, preconceptions. If I've been told it's fair, then the underlying assumption should be it's fair. The alternative hypothesis, or alternate hypothesis would be, I am now trying to prove that it's an unfair dice and that it's weighted more towards sixes, i.e. the probability that you get a six is actually higher than a one in six chance, essentially. So if I was to think about the theoretical probabilities that would happen, well, how many ways are there of not rolling a six from 10 rolls? Well, I roll the dice once, I've got a five-sixth chance of not getting a six, and then I roll it again, five-six chance, five-six times five-six times five-six, and so on. And that works out to be around about 0 0.15, 0 0.16, whatever it is. And so if we look at this chart, the number of sixes along the bottom is there, and the heights of each of those bars, the probability you get that. So the most likely outcome is you'll get one out of 10 sixes, and that looks to me about just over 0 0.3. So around about a 30% chance that you'll get one out of 10 sixes, um, and so on. So fine. So say, for example, I roll this dice 10 times, and I see that five out of 10 of them are sixes. Now, was I just really lucky? Maybe. So all of the probabilities of five and above, if I chose that to be my cutoff period, if I summed up all of them, and that's clearly going to be less than 5%, according to this graph, it's clearly going to be less than five. I mean, I'd have to add up five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sixes, and so on, but those probabilities are so small and the graph just stopped after six because um, it's pretty close to zero after that. But, but, but it could still technically happen. Um, but if you added all those up, it's going to be less than than 5%, 0.05. And so we would say that the probability of getting five or more sixes from 10 dice rolls would be our critical region. So because the probability of it being five or more is so small, we would say that's so statistically unlikely that that's evidence to suggest that something's up, i.e. it's so freaky that mm, that's not really what we're expecting. And it's in the top 5% weirdest outcomes that it shouldn't really happen. Um, now you could slide that up to 1%, you could slide up to 0.01%, it doesn't matter. Um, usually it's around about 5% when doing experiments or 1% or whatever. And there's trade-offs by making it too high or too low. And we'll talk about that in a second when it comes to errors. But for, for this, a p-value of 0 0.05 means that if you've drawn a conclusion, that means the results were in the freakiest f top five or bottom, if you're, if you're going for a different tail test, th they were in the weirdest 5% category of expected outcomes. So you would say that's evidence to suggest that there is a difference. So in the previous slides, when it was talking about there was no difference between the improvement between uh, the CRT group and the PT group, it's because they performed a hypothesis test and the expected results you'd expect to see between those two groups weren't in the top X percent freakiest for it to valid a statistical difference. And so I think all those p-values are around about 0 0.01. Um, and so you could argue if you'd lowered it to 0 0.1 or 0 0.05 that maybe it had been picked up, but they, it is what it is. Um, and we'd actually say that critical region in this case is any value greater than four. Okay. And so why is that important? Um, because... It, you'll see phrases like the power of the test or P equals or P is less than certain stuff. And the P stuff is the significance of the test. And the significance is essentially saying, what is the cutoff, the freakiest percentage for us to warrant a particular uh, diagnosis? I.e., if we've come to a conclusion and the significance is 0 0.01, 
that means our results were in the 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 one percent freakiest that we could have possibly expected therefore we've come to the conclusion that it must be the alternate hypothesis this is true and we've rejected what's called the null hypothesis i.e there's no correlation um, the power of the test uh, size and power of the test the statistical measures uh, used to essentially almost like guess ourselves like what's the probability that we've actually made the right decision and so the power of the test is essentially saying what is the chance that we've rejected that null hypothesis correctly so the power is the chance of correctly rejecting a null hypothesis um, so that means if we had done that right and there clearly is a because there's two distributions at place there's the distribution that we're expecting and there's the possible unknown distribution of what's actually happening and there's always going to be an overlap with that and so the type 2 error is essentially saying well given this unknown distribution what's the probability that we've actually come to the right conclusion and so having it as 0 0.8 is pretty good uh so we're 80 percent confident if i was to bring it up to 90 percent or higher uh you're making it you know, more susceptible to type two errors. And we'll talk about errors in a second. Um, and so a type two error would be that you think the null hypothesis is true when actually it's not. And similarly, if you brought the power down from 0 0.8, then you might say, well, what's the point? Everything is gonna be in the alternate hypothesis range. So what's the point of even doing this test? Everything, everything is susceptible. Um, and so how do you explain errors well let's suppose you're um in a really wild example you're way back in time back to the stone age and you're walking through the jungle or whatever it is and you hear some you hear a rustling noise in the bush and your primitive brain can't do much reasoning and before it kicks into the fight and flight response and all that rubbish you've essentially your brain is thinking is it just wind going through the trees or is it possibly some kind of tiger, saber-toothed tiger, something like that? I don't know, some kind of vicious animal, predator, whatever. So your brain is thinking, which one is it? Is it, is it safe? Is it just the wind? Or is it potentially dangerous as an animal? And so your brain has to make a decision. Now, if you think, if you think it's a predator, but it's actually just the wind, so you run away, but it was just the wind, you're a scaredy cat. That's called a type one error, i.e. the null hypothesis is nothing's wrong, everything's fine, stop assuming things, stop making up these demons in your head, stop trying to prove something that's not the norm, but you thought it was that thing you made up, so the alternate hypothesis. So technically it's where you reject the null hypothesis, you accept the alternate hypothesis, the thing you're trying to prove that is different, but actually nothing's nothing's up. It's just everything's fine as expected. That's a type one error. And if you reject the null hypothesis, or you think there's a tiger and there was a tiger, then you made the correct conclusion because you've run away for good reason because there was a tiger, everything's fine. Whereas if you think it's just the wind and it was just the wind, that's also a correct conclusion, right? So you've not jumped the gun, you kept your cool, you carried about your day, everything's fine. Whereas if you've accepted the null hypothesis, but there actually was a tiger, that's a type two error. So you've assumed nothing's wrong, i.e. H naught, the, the, the null hypothesis is true, but actually something's at play. And the problem with increasing the power of the, the test is you're sliding that threshold up that critical value, or, or rather you're sliding the two distributions apart so that that type two area is getting smaller. So what's actually happening is you're more likely to pick a value that according to your hypothesis test would say, oh no, everything's fine. There's no, there's nothing wrong here. Don't worry about it. When in actual fact, you've missed it. You've, you've, you've made the wrong decision. And I, I call that the costly fatal errors. So type one errors are the, like the scaredy cat errors, the play safe ones. You've been safe than sorry. You're overly cautious. The type two ones are the lazy ones. You know, 
the the ones where you think the teacher's not going to check your homework but actually the teacher's checking your homework and now you're stuck there going oh dear i'm in trouble um similarly you know another example for type 2 errors you're speeding down the motorway uh and you see a traffic camera and in your mind you're thinking well it might not be on it might be on and so you will think ah, it's probably not on it'll be fine and then you whiz through it at 90 miles an hour and then you get a flash and it's like oh actually it was on and that's cost you um points and a fine and stuff whereas a type one error would be uh it's a 70 mile an hour limit or something and you're bombing it down at 80 miles an hour or whatever it is and you go oh uh, the the traffic it's, it's going to catch me and you slow right down to 40 miles an hour and you're driving slowly 40 miles an hour through the speed trap but actually the the speed camera was never turned on even if you'd have sped through it, it never would have caught you you know what i mean so making type 2 errors are pretty costly and increasing the power unnecessarily of the test um might seem like a good thing because then you're more confident of your results if you come to a conclusion in actual fact can increase the type of or increase the amount of type 2 errors that you have um so if you i mean subject variability and sample size being too small you could argue well uh yeah mm, you know it's a bit up in the air but when you look at the significance values and they're all about one percent five percent at most and 0.1 percent at least uh which are very very low and then when you look at the power of the test being 80 percent which is very high and you think about how actually statistically that's that's pretty good data um yeah i've i'm i'm pretty happy um with the reliability of that and i actually find that fairly useful is what i'm i'm saying from a mathematical point of view um and then i think um one more thing to talk about is does this mean that my combined event athletes are never going to be using weights at all or should they ever? Uh, and the short answer is no. Um, variability, lots of different stimuli, I think, is crucial to growth. That's, I mean, that's an unproven philosophy, but I'm, I'm all for it. There is a plethora of articles that would suggest that there, there is, there are benefits to strength training, um, and in particular, um, developing connective tissues, um, tendons, elasticity, all that kind of stuff. Um, so there are benefits to strength training for sure. Um, I think the key thing, and I kind of glossed over it before the SSC, the stretch shortening cycle. So as you can see in that diagram down there, you've got the eccentric phase of it loading the amortization where it's, it's about to recoil back and the concentric contraction of the muscles where they're, you know, they're contracting concentrically and pushing off through the floor. Um, as long as as the transition between those stages is rapid so you get an elastic reaction you're using a tendons in an elastic way and all that stuff that is the key to explosive movement and if you're not strong enough to go through them uh, or to to if your connective tissues aren't strong enough or durable enough your muscles aren't strong enough to go through it then what will probably happen is you spend more than you need to in one particular phase. You, you see what, what a lot of coaches would call a long ground contact time. It's too short. It's kind of uh, heavy and they're really struggling to generate the force to get off the ground and that kind of stuff. And when that happens, it's no longer plyometric. And so I'd probably say my personal opinion is that resistance exercise only needs to be so that the athlete is strong enough to perform uh, plyometrics without too much ground contact time. I think once and and, and what how long is too ground who how long is too much on ground contact time? Well, you'll kind of see it with some athletes. If you if you have this gut feeling like oh they're so heavy footed they're so and all the rest of it, it's probably an indicator they're not strong enough. Um, and that doesn't mean you beast them in the gym. It means you could do some light resistance work with bands, with medicine balls, that kind of stuff. It could just be doing the plyometrics themselves. But, you know, it could be that if you want a greater plyometric reaction, your muscles need to be uh, more prepared for that kind of explosive force. 
uh, that needs to be unlocked by plyometrics. And so I get the idea that maybe the strength training via resistance work is more of a supplement and it's it's there just to make sure, okay, all the boxes are ticked and I'm ready to perform this exercise in a safe way rather than I'm going to do a 200 kilo back squat and by upping my training up to 220 kilo back squat, I'm suddenly going to jump higher. That's That's not what conventional resistance training, I feel, um, should be used for it shouldn't be a big case of oh well i'm doing higher numbers in the gym so therefore i'm gonna jump further throw further run faster i think it's more complicated than that um, and I, I think it's a good indicator of the next step i.e be able to handle a much better more explosive efficient sh you know uh, stretch shortening cycle i apply metric explosive movement but it's not guaranteed that you're going to do that.